Okay, hello everyone. Um, bonjour, right? I warmly welcome you to first Thanoscon ever um, in KubeCon uh, EU 2024 in Paris, a collocated day. We are super excited to be here and, and you know, spend half a day to talk about, you know, focus on tunnels, focus on using tunnels, maintaining, developing, and really celebrating this together um, for the first time. So I'm super excited. Who else is excited? Are you excited? Make noise. Woo! Yeah, that's some energy. Amazing. So my name is Bartek Wodka, but I will introduce myself uh, more later on. And I'm today with Michael. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Michael. Uh, also, warm bonjour for myself. And um, I'm an SRE at Ivan, though only for two more weeks, after which I'll start a position at Cloudfair, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I joined the community last year and generally have too much time on my hands, so I enjoy spending that hacking on Thanos. But uh, enough of that. What even is a Thanos? I, I kind of suppose most of you already know what the Thanos is, and, um, but for, for those Thanos curious folks of you wandering the halls of KubeCon this year and finding yourself in this room, first of all, welcome. And second of all, you will hear about Thanos all day, so I keep this very brief and give a very reductive summary. Um, Thanos is a system of microservices that can conspire to provide a highly available Prometheus setup uh, with long-term storage capabilities. It also provides a single pane of glass for all your metrics and keeps them queryable on large ranges through downsampling and compaction. But as I said, you will hear enough about Thanos during, during this conference. So uh, much more exciting to me. ThanosCon. Well, 2023 has been a pretty great year for Thanos. We had lots of new triage members, maintainer team members, lots of features. In fact, we have a dedicated talk for it given by a fellow maintainer, Saswata, during the course of this day. Um, lots of new stargazers, corporate adopters, CNCF hashtag Thanos channel dwellers, docker pullers, and issue submitters, which is just a sign of a great and thriving community. And um, as the slide shows, we had uh, six talks last year and three conferences, three at PromCon and um, three at KubeCon EU and KubeCon NA. So we figured it's time for a dedicated event for this project where you, the community, can meet, connect, and uh, yeah, geek out about Thanos. And uh, thank you all for being here and making this making this a thing. That's great. Uh, Bartek, do you want to take the formalities? Of course, I love formalities. Um, yeah, so for organizational's point of view, make sure you follow code of contact. Let's make sure the space is you know safe and uh, and friendly for everyone. Um, golden rule: treat others as you'd like to be treated. Um, so remember. Um, captioning, so for this event, captioning is available, so if you would like to translate things, uh, you know, and have a caption with, in your own language in, on your device, just make sure to scan this QR code and, um, and yeah, like, use it. It's, it's super useful. Uh, let's quickly go over the agenda. We have a couple more minutes. Um, when we created this, this event and uh, submitted the call for papers. We, we did not anticipate that we would get like 30 talks and we had to just pick six of them because we only have half a day. But uh, rest assured, those six talks are pretty entertaining. So um, this will be great. Uh, we'll be starting strong with a retrospective of the Thanos project by its original masterminds and what they learned from the journey of creating a successful open source project. Then we will have not one, but two case studies of massive Thanos deployments in the wild and the challenge they faced and how they managed the clusters in production, uh, Cloudflare and Reddit respectively, followed by a quick um, recap of 2023 by Saswata, as I already mentioned. Then a really exciting talk, um, um, an entirely new single pane of glass use case unlocked by our new distributed query engine that drastically improves the utility of the Thanos querier. This is really exciting to me. Um, 
Then we'll see how to um, how Tronos can serve as a multi-tenant monitoring solution and um, learn about the best practices and gotchas setting that up. And last but not least, uh, Thanos receiver is known as one of the trickier components to operate and keep running. And Joel will share his journey, his hard fought lessons about uh, keeping this running most of the time at least. And then we already reached the end of ThanosCon, but um, it's already lunchtime, so probably you're happy about that. And we can connect over, over lunch and celebrate Thanos. Yeah. We're prepared to start this event. Bartek, Fabian, take it away. Thank you, Michael. Oh yeah, let's go. So, um, yeah, my name is Bartek Botka, and today I'm really excited uh, to be here with Fabian Reynards to start this event with a short story about Thanos' beginnings. And for those who don't know, we happen to be initial authors of Thanos project, uh, you know, with the initial design and creating the first MVP. I think it was six years ago or so. And to be honest, it doesn't matter like who started the project because this project in this state, in this amazing state right now, is thanks to relentless open source work from 20 or more members of the team, 600 unique contributors with 80 roughly active contributors monthly, which is amazing. Six years of really amazing growth, organic growth, honest work and open source collaboration. However, being from the start, I think, of this project and seeing its growth, um, you know, gave me and Fabian a bit of perspective, right, um, on what worked and what didn't work over the, uh, along the way, what helped really to build successful project and what didn't. And that's why I really wanted to bring Fabian today um, so we could discuss what was the most surprising learnings from this journey. And since six, six years have passed since the creation of the Thanos, we have a six learnings for you. So let's rewind to the beginnings of Thanos and the story begins uh, really, really years before Thanos' you know, first line of code. And, the, you know, it started with the Fabian Burr, <laughs> how Fabian was born. No, that's, of course, it's not, um, it, it's actually more uh, situated. So before Thanos actually, uh, you know, happened, I worked, I happened to work at a startup called Improbable. We are early Prometheus and Kubernetes adopters, especially because we run dozens of Kubernetes clusters around the world. Uh, plus other environments, uh, ephemeral clusters, and so on. So we are hitting some Prometheus, you know, issues on scale. And we are on the ThanosCon, so I really, I don't need, I don't think I really have to explain in details what those issues are, because probably you are here because of them. Um, but just, you know, TLDR is, you know, global view, inability to support long retention, uh, reliability of storage, and not mentioning dynamic scaling that we have to, um, we, and it's always good to have. And we knew that we are not alone in this problem. So we went for hand for the solution. And obviously we started with existing solutions in this space, right? We just didn't want to manage, but we, know, we knew some basic requirements. We didn't need, want to manage disks on Kubernetes, right? We were kind of sick of running Elasticsearch for logs for a long time on Kubernetes. We really wanted to keep our Prometheus uh, dashboards, alerts, instrumentations, and, and so on, because it serves us so much, uh, so, so well. So we're looking for something that looks like Prometheus, but it scales. And one of this project at the time was Cortex, uh, which started in 2016 as a project Frankenstein, uh, Frankenstein actually, by our dear friend uh, Tom Wilkie. And it was really, really close um, to something we needed. Like we collaborated together, we, we meet with the, with the team, but it was a little bit too complex and expensive due to DynamoDB dependency, um, and, but still, we tried to kind of like contribute big table um, support instead of DynamoDB for indexes. And I did, I remember the, doing some, you know, POC with this, but it was just not clicking, right? The operational uh, and cost difference between running just Prometheus servers versus, you know, like a full blown Cortex cluster was, was just a little bit too big. Um, now, what I really love about, you know, what I really loved about working at, at this London startup at that time, is that we didn't just complain or just, I don't know, look for a vendor or project that will just solve all our, our problems without any work. We were actually willing to put the effort and deep level work to get things done. 
So really thanks to the leadership of this company, I guess, the technical, at least for the infrastructure team, we started to reach out to Prometheus community members for help, for suggestions. And we were really lucky to contact Fabian. Great, hi, uh, great to be here. Um, so I want to take you back a bit to around the same time from the Prometheus team perspective. Um, so back then we were quite busy um, shipping Prometheus 2.0. Um, so that was, if you recall, the release where we had the new TSDB. Um, it took about half a year probably to like fully integrate this, polish it, harden it. Um, and as part of that, we worked with our users right, to uh, really get this like, um, stress test. Um, and overall, Prometheus 2.0 launched around end of 2017. Um, and this new TSDB was a big leap forward. Um, I think resource consumption improved like 10x or more on some dimensions. So it really like helped this vertical scalability of Prometheus, um, which solved some of the kind of scaling problems that uh, Improbable and other companies had. Um, but at the same time, I also felt we are kind of reaching the limits of, of how far we can take this, right? I didn't see another 10x improvement um, to be gained in, in just a single node. Um, and besides that, just making it more scalable in one node doesn't solve all the problems that you mentioned, right? Like it doesn't give you transparent HA. Um, it doesn't give you a global view if you have like Prometheus servers in different data centers. And it also doesn't give you like reliable persistence um, for long-term storage. Um, so it's only kind of part of the equation. So the question was, what's next? Like what's, how do we solve the next level of problems that our users are having? Um, and all these problems you mentioned are not new, right? Yet they have been kind of being brought up by the community for like years. Um, and as such, I've been thinking about them over the years on and off, right? Um, and I always felt like it's possible to do this in kind of, some kind of additive way, right? Like add this on top of Prometheus um, without making it more complex to operate, right? Because the operation simplicity was definitely one of the core features of the whole thing that made people um, really come to like it. Um, and I, I bounced around ideas, I think, on this over the years, right? One of them was like certainly object storage as a storage mechanism for long-term storage which kind of frees you from having to manage disks. Um, but it wasn't super popular from what I recall. So I think on the one side, you had, we had kind of folks who were like, it, it's gonna get more complex operationally and we can't have that because it's like a system that you rely on for your operations. So it has to be as simple as possible. And that's how we have federation, right? And that's how what you should be using. Um, and then the other side, I guess, was, hey, you can't actually build this thing without getting more complex. So we have to build something complex. Um, in hindsight, I guess, right, we can say, like, even though there were significant doubts, right, it, there were, like, some ideas that made sense, as Thanos ultimately seemed to work out. Um, so the first learning, I think, from this whole project with hindsight is, well, you have to question this at a score, right? You should get feedback and, and listen to it and digest it, right? But if you think there's something there that's worth exploring, um, probably just go for it. Um, and as I mentioned, we were, like, working with our users to test and stress test uh, Prometheus 2.0, and one of these users was improbable. They have had one of the, I think, largest deployments of Prometheus across kind of the globe in many data centers. Um, so they were a really good candidate and they gave us really good feedback. Um, and I dug around in emails, like yesterday on the train, um, and I found uh, one by Michal, uh, where he mentioned, hey, uh, this new TSDB has like this nice storage format, uh, can't we just like put these blocks into object storage and then fetch them again on demand for querying? Um, and that was kind of, quite aligned with where my head was at the time. Um, so we got talking, and talking, and talking, and talking. Um, and it took another six months um, to actually get to a point where we had, um, we're ready to actually collaborate on this, right? As, as Bartek mentioned, Improbable was quite keen on actually investing into this, right, in terms of like um, resources. Um, but it took time to actually align on like what, what we actually want to build, right? What time frame we have, um, and how we can make this collaboration happen. Um, but after six months of back and forth, um, yeah, we finally got started um, and I flew to London um, and spent the first week of this project um, at the Improbable office and here you can see a picture of that time. Um, yeah, and we got going. And in, in hindsight, I think the second learning is that sometimes you need luck because when I went through this email chain, um, there were like so many opportunities for like nothing to happen, right? Way more opportunities than for this thing to actually work out. Uh, I think it's quite lucky that we actually got to work on this together. Um, yeah, um, and when we started working on this together, um, as you can see, first commit here, it, this thing was still called Prom LTS as a kind of working title, so Prometheus Long Term Storage. Um, and Bartek actually found out there was actually one commit before the initial commit, um, which was the commit created by someone at Improbable to set up the repository, 
And as you can nicely see, this was meant to be open source from the very start because the very first commit actually adds the license file for the Apache 2 license. Uh, and we spent three months just like heads down building this first MVP. Um, and I think the really cool thing about this is that for an MVP, it was, was pretty full-fledged, right? It had like all the bells and whistles of the, of the core feature set, basically. Um, we had this query federation mechanism, right, where you can like fan out to multiple data centers if you want. We had persistence into object storage. We had compaction in there, which included downsampling. Um, and we had transparent HA, which I think is like the thing I maybe like the most. Um, and even more importantly, we actually deployed this to production while we were working on this. Um, and that's really kind of alluding to this additive approach I mentioned before, right? Um, by making this pluggable on top of your existing deployments, um, this was really, really easy to adopt with really low risk, right? Because by just adding something on top, if it doesn't work out, nothing breaks, the operations are not affected, um, and you can just see where that works, and if yes, great, if not, well, you just go back. Um, and that kind of confirmed the hypothesis, right? That users are not necessarily unhappy with Prometheus, they just want something more on top of it. Um, so the third thing is, I think, you have to really meet your users where they are, and you have to understand where they are, and that it's actually possible to build something in three months and start using it uh, instead of like a much, much longer time horizon. Um, yeah, and about a month after this three months kind of project work, um, we actually presented Tana to the public. Uh, I think it was at the Cloudflare office at the Prometheus or General Observability Meetup. Meet yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and everything from here on onwards is Bartek's story again. Yeah. Thank you, Fabian. Yeah, so this MVP creation, like this three months of like uh, deep, deep down work was, was super insightful to me. Um, and one of the learning that I just realized, you know, now when looking on it was how important it was time to market here and, um, you know, to deliver something that can be used and have a great design and have, high, you know, code quality and so on, but something finished. Right, something that people can you know install and 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 use and try out before maybe community moves to other problems uh, and so on. So maybe that's you know obvious, but we tend to drag our software development a bit, right? This is because maybe I don't know coding is fun. We just keep going. Maybe we are afraid that a, the solution is not perfect yet um, or fully tested. But the thing is that what I learned I think from Fabian really is the pragmatic push um, to deliver high quality software. Uh, at given time, right? So when that time appears, you literally stop whatever you are doing, you pack whatever you have in consumable package, you document this, literally you write a blog post, uh, create a talk for the nearest meetup nearby, and, and you do it. And this is kind of like amazing, kind of like, you know, achievable thing um, that you just deliver. And then once you, you've done that, you know, you think what's next from that on, that on how to, you can improve it, how to add more tests and so on. And I think it really, you know, the fact that we kind of like did it and finished, it established like a really good foundation for, yeah, like ton of success. And I rarely see this process being so productive, you know, in other projects I have been even, uh, you know, participating in. Um, and one aspect that really helped this happening is, is really that deep focus, right? And I really mean that, like, I literally did nothing else for those three, two months, except maybe Christmas. Um, but really design the code and, and write the code, test it, and, and, and you know, ship the initial version of Thanos. I, I don't think in, if I will ever have that deep focus ever in my life because I have a baby, you know, I have open source duties these days, there are distractions, and the, the thing is, like, try to find the, the space for deep focus if you want to achieve, you know, like something, I don't know, very quickly, um, something solid. And, and, and really, yeah, I would try to get this deep focus at some point when I want to build new things. And this is, yeah, super important learning for me. So after MVP, after, you know, um, beginning of 2018, we started, yeah, just, just grinding, fixing bugs, finalizing feature was, was mostly me. And, but, you know, after time, you know, new adopters and, uh, you know, users came in and, and helped me to kind of build tunnels. It started very small. Like literally I started Slack channel and I was helping users who had questions, then those users who I helped, they help other people and kind of compound effect, you know, like, um, you know, was built on top of that where users were helping each other, or then kind of like doing so much work that we transitioned them to Thanos maintainer and so on. So it was, was really beautiful to see, you know, another milestone of course was, you know, just the recognition from CNCF that we are the project, the project is maturing. So we donated the project to uh, CNCF as a sandbox stage and then, you know, immediately year after we end up being in incubation state. And honestly, we could try to even, you know, apply for graduation state, but 
I don't know, let us know if you'd like to start to see. To me, it's like, yeah, we could do it, but like there's, I'm not sure if this is like uh, super high priority here. Um, but generally, CNCF help. Like, look, we are in the Tanoscon. They help us to organize this event, and they help us massively along the way to spread the message and, and really maintain the Thanos in a, in a you know, um, vendor agnostic, let's say, um, in an open source license way. Another worth noting change happened in Thanos in 2019, where Frederick Ranch, uh, Ranchik proposed with the Red Hat team and executed actually the remote write support to Thanos. Uh, or what we call receiver deployment. From that point, Thanos was able not only to query Prometheus via sidecar, uh, but also, you know, like ingest the remote write streams out of any source um, uh, of metrics. And we could, um, yeah, we could say really that receiver mode nowadays is equal or if not more popular than the sidecar mode. And many, many organizations, and you will see from today's talk, Talks, uh, they have a hybrid approach where they, you know, use mix mix of those uh, modes, sidecar and the receiver on the way. So it was a great um, contribution from Red Hat, and I actually end up joining Red Hat um, because how active they were, and many people, many people are still maintainers from Red Hat. So so amazing core contribution there. But some learning I want to share with you here is that um, the introduction of the receiver is really like a good moment to um, to think about it. It's um, again something I think I learned from Fabian, but it's just that upfront design matters, right? Like really think through your abstractions, interfaces, APIs. Um, it might take time, but, but you know, and keep it time boxed, <laughs> but uh, generally it's worth it, right? In case of Thanos, initial development and final, um, this is what, what, what we want to really share. The final, the, the, the design and, and those ideas, this abstraction APIs didn't happen in those two, three months, right? It happened actually two years even before uh, starting coding, right? Because uh, we were bouncing the idea around. We had this idea forming up. It's, it's just we finalized them, maybe, but um, it took, you know, two years. Um, so for the receiver mode, uh, it wouldn't happen if you would not have a store API, right? And so our gRPC API that just, you know, uh, packs in a, in a useful way, um, you know, the ability to, to fetch series from any source. And, you know, Thanks of that, receiving kind of remote write code was as simple as embedding Prometheus existing TSDB code into a process um, to produce and, and you know have it to expose store API and receive the remote write and it was like the initial work was done. So so it was kind of beautiful how this interface, well designed, you know, allowed this use case without changing it at all, right? And changing other parts of tunnels that have to connect to it. And many other features, when you think about it, like state for those six years without changing, right? We still have functional sharding in a sense of like uh, your querier can pick what sources to, uh, to, uh, to query based on external labels. We still use object storage as our main source of truth of data. We use still this DB format in an unchanged format um, since beginnings. We use PromQL, of course, uh, we love it. And down sampling, it, you know, it's, I think it's, it's we, we, I mean, it was designed at the end of, the, of this MVP process, but it, it served us well, and uh, you know we didn't literally change it. And uh, yeah, so so all those things stayed for the six years, and which prove how strong foundations really pays off here. Last but not the least aspect um, is community work, of course. Uh, writing code and fixing bugs is one thing, but um, helping others, teaching them how to use the project and enabling new maintainers is a really important step. And I'm really grateful for the community and, 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 Tano, and the Thanos team that jumped and helped me um, with a lot of energy to mentor, you know, like new members in the community to deliver, you know, Thanos talks, um, you know, maintain community meetings and did like uh, hundreds of releases. It, 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 it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and kind of the learning here to me, I want to share final learning is proactive community that enables people. What I mean? It's not enough to just write blog posts and just, you know, do talks. Um, I think what worked for, for Thanos project is about pers personally connecting with other people, potential users, potential contributors or maintainers, uh, listening to their story and listening to what they need and actually enabling them, trying to help solve their problems, um, sometimes mentor them, sometimes literally teaching them Linux or teaching Git from scratch. and. Um, but almost always, I remember directly reaching to those people who asked questions like in the very beginning, uh, you know, and, and trying to help them 
um, you know, for example, on Slack, right? I literally you know, always direct messaging them, and I was kind of like proactive in a sense of like, oh, we have this idea, you solve it. Like, let's come with me and and have a talk, Thanos talk about it. Let's have a blog post. Let's maybe you want to be a contributor and maintainer officially and take more responsibilities. I was asking those questions and and. And, and, and being very direct, right? It's not, I was not waiting for maintainers to just come to me, right? So it's, this is important step. Be proactive and help them and, and don't really expect anything in return, but in reality, the, 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 the love will come back to you, right? And um, you have to give essentially without expecting anything back and it pays off. I see people kind of growing um, thanks to interacting with Thanos. And I, uh, I know about several people who got really amazing job thanks of being part of Thanos team or contributing. And, and this is super powerful, super amazing. It's kind of a side effect of the project. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited to, to, for this to kind of like continue and enable more people. Um, so finally, to sum up, I'm particularly grateful um, of Thanos growth, right? This is uh, the history of our stars in GitHub. It, look how linear this is. This is going kind of up. And, and it, it looks totally different than a normal hype kind of cycle where you have a hype and then, you know, like a rejection and then maybe stabilization. And this is because it's organic growth. It's, it's very healthy. And all of this is, you know, um, without even one zero version, without mentioning this beta and stable marketing work sometimes, um, even though we were super stable, we deprecated, I think, two things generally uh, in the history of Thanos. So I think it's something we, it's worth celebrating today. So thank you so much, and we're open for questions. Yeah, let's have some questions if you have any. Go for it, just try to. Uh, when and why did you change from from LTS? Okay, so when, I will repeat the question. When and why uh, we changed from the LTS to Thanos in terms of some naming, right? Yeah. I think immediately, kind of like, uh, like literally when the first second commit appeared, I don't know, probably the same week, we kind of like, of course, we were um, discussing the name. And if you are curious, um, essentially we have in, in this improbable startup, we have infrastructure with multiple microservices and they always have superhero names from Marvel, from whatever. We have, for example, Spider-Man that was hosting web, of course. We have uh, Aquamans, we have... Iron Man, Iron Man, I remember, was uh, orchestrating virtual machines, Iron, right? So lots of stuff. So we really wanted to, to have a hero. And Thanos was clicking because he was, you know, halving, <laughs> killing half of your problems, monitoring problems, um, and, and generally work well. Yeah, I think that's the story. All right, we have to really finish uh, for another talk, but uh, thank you so much. And we are, you know, you can grab us for more questions later on. Thank you.